This is Dave, your Wet Fly Swing podcast host. Today I've got a special announcement and an extra special episode for you today. This is the start of our series with Stillwater guru Phil Roy, author of The Orvis Guide to Stillwater Trout Fishing, renowned fly fishing show speaker, and our good friend. This will be an opportunity to let Phil take the lead and host select episodes of this podcast focused on helping you up your Stillwater game this year. If you have a Stillwater question at any point, you can check in with Phil at flycraftangling.com. Okay, let's let Phil take the mic and knock this one out of the park. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Littoral Zone podcast. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. The Littoral Zone, or shoal area of a lake, is the place where the majority of the action takes place. My podcast is intended to do the same to help you improve your Stillwater fly fishing. On each broadcast, I, along with guests from all over the world, will be providing you with information, tips and tricks, flies, presentation techniques, along with different lakes to explore. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Please feel free to email me with your Stillwater questions and comments. I do my best to answer as many as we can prior to each episode, just before the main content. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy today's show. Today we'll be discussing one of the questions I most often ask when it comes to still water fly fishing. How do you consistently find fish? Lakes, when compared to rivers and streams, are vast and intimidating, and for many they're defeated before they start. Well today I'm going to share the approach I've developed for over 40 years of chasing trout and other game fish all over North America and beyond. But first, before we get started, I want to respond to a few specific still water questions I've received before we dive into my strategies, tactics, and techniques for figuring out where to go on a lake and successfully catch a few fish. Time to experience the littoral zone with Phil Roy. The first question is another common still water question, and actually one I'll dive into in greater depth during a future episode. Just what is the right fly rod for still water fishing? The question I received asked if a 9 foot 6 weight would work for lakes. The answer in short is yes. First of all, you always use the rods you have. All fly rods will work. But you've got to ask yourself if you plan on using the rod for other things or do you plan on having it specifically for lake fishing. If you want to have one specifically for lake fishing, I would recommend a rod between 5 and 7 weight, preferably 9.5 or better yet 10 feet long. And why do I like these long rods? Well, first of all, they offer so many advantages. The ability to steer and control fish. When you're fighting a fish in and around your boat or your pontoon boat or float tube, there's always hazards for fish to wrap around. Your legs if you're in a float tube or a pontoon boat. Your anchor ropes, a drogue, all these different things fish love to find. You can use that long rod to extend your reach and just steer the fish away of of those dangers. If you're using an indicator you can't uh, reposition once it's set on your leader, then it gives you simply a greater working distance. A longer rod transmits into a longer set distance between your indicator and fly. If you want to use roll casts, and that's a preferred tactic of mine, especially when using strike indicator tactics, a long rod offers an excellent roll cast. A superior hang. The hang is a specific tactic we use with cast and retrieve techniques. At the end of every retrieve, we raise the rod slowly to induce any fish following the fly to take it. We pause and hang the fly right at the surface or just below. The long rod gives you a longer, better hang, especially when you're using multiple flies if you're allowed to do so. We also use mending techniques and reach casts and things like that, especially when using floating line techniques such as indicators and long leader weighted flies. We even do it with dry flies. So that long rod gives you a better mend and control of your line so you can stay in contact with your fly so there's no slack in your system. I like moderate fast action rods. So those kind of rods, when they're long in that 10 foot range or longer, Um, They give you that soft tip of those rods will give you a better protection on your hook set so you don't accidentally break fish off when fishing indicators, you get that aggressive smash take. And arguably, they help facilitate more open loops, resulting in less tangles. This is ideal when using long leaders, multiple flies, nothing more frustrating than uh, things getting tangled up. So again, to summarize, if you're going to have one rod dedicated to still water fishing, I would go with a long rod, minimum nine and a half feet, preferably 10 feet in that five to seven weight range. Again, we'll probably delve into this in a future episode in much greater depth. 
My next question surrounded electric motors and what pound thrust I prefer to use with my pontoon boats to conserve weight. Well, I always recommend using the most powerful electric motor you can. I personally use a 55 pound thrust Minkota motor. This is the largest size motor you can get to be powered by a 12 volt battery system. Anything beyond that it requires 24 or 36 volt systems. Much too many batteries for a pontoon boat for sure. The reason I use that 55 pound thrust motor is because it can be used not only on my pontoon boats but also in my smaller lake boats as well. So I have that versatility to transfer that motor back and forth. The high thrust speed allows me to cruise slowly and conserve energy or if I need to move fast to get out of the way of something or if a fast storm is fast approaching, I have that horsepower in reserve to get me moving fast. I did a quick check on the internet. Minn Kota motors, on average, weigh about 42 pounds. So there's not really an appreciable difference between a 55-pound thrust motor and, say, a 30- or 40-pound thrust motor. The weight really comes into play in the regards to the battery. Lead-acid batteries are heavy. Lithium-ion batteries weigh around 25, 26 pounds. Alternatively, a lead-acid battery can weigh up to 41 pounds or more. So they're heavy, they're not fun to lug around, and that's where the real weight concern comes in. If you can afford them and justify one, I would recommend a lithium battery. I just got one last year and I just fell in love with it. They're half the weight of, as I, as I mentioned, as a regular lead-acid battery. They're easier to maintain. They last for years. 10 years if you take care of them. Um, they last longer between charges and again they weigh next to nothing so I highly recommend them. My last question focuses on indicator colors. I was asked if I had a preferred color for my quick release indicators. Now if you're not familiar my quick release indicators come in hot yellow, bright green, hot orange, hot pink and sunburst orange. And I have a cross section of all the colors. And this comes for, for a number of reasons. First of all some people see different colors better than others, so there's that to factor in. Light conditions, though, on the water conditions have a real impact on my indicator choice. I tend to use bright colors, the hot pinks, the hot oranges, the sunburst orange, on bright days with a high sun, or particularly when I have the sun at my back. When the days are overcast and dreary, I tend to lean towards hot yellow or bright green. And when I'm fishing in glare conditions where you're casting into the sunlight or a situation where it's very difficult to see those hot colors because they get blended in and sucked up with all that glare, I actually have a black permanent marker on hand that I'll hold the indicator by the peg and quickly transition that indicator from whatever color it is to all black, using that black indicator to silhouette against that bright background. So hopefully these questions help you out. I always enjoy answering any and all still water fly fishing questions and fly fishing questions in general for that matter. And if you have a specific question, let me know via my email, flycraft at shaw.ca or through my Phil Rowley Fly Fishing Facebook and Instagram pages. Many of the times, these questions are so good, they often form the basis for future podcast episodes, so be sure to get your questions in. I appreciate you send them in, and remember, there's no dumb questions. They're all great questions, and uh, hopefully I can help you out so you can catch more fish the next time you're out on the lake. Now, let's get into the subject of today's podcast. Just how do you find trout in productive still waters, or in any lake for that matter? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about my tricks, techniques, and strategies that I've developed over 40 years of chasing trout and other game fish all over the North America and all over the world for that matter. Well, when we first want to think about it, a lot of fly fishers come from a moving water environment. They fished rivers and streams. So there's some differences to think about when you're fly fishing a lake. First of all, the trout move and the water doesn't. In other words, trout are cruisers in lakes. They don't sit behind logs or tuck under undercut banks. And depending on the um, the climate, uh, rather the environment that they live in, um, some trout populations may live in one portion of the lake if all of their needs are met for their entire lifetime. So still water trout have a pretty simple existence. They swim, they eat, and if they're lucky, they get to mate and pass on their genetics to a new generation of trout. So still water trout don't live in holes or around sunken trees or behind a rock. They cruise by those items, but they don't hold on them like they would in a river or stream or perhaps another game fish such as a bass or a pike. So when you're looking at uh, fishing lakes and trying to find trout in lakes, you can take a lot of the lessons that you used to use and the tricks and techniques that you used as well to find trout in rivers and streams 
exactly the same in lakes. They just have to tweak them a little bit. Now, of course, when you get to a lake, you're standing there on the shore, and it can be pretty intimidating. Lakes are vast, daunting. You know, sometimes you can't even see the other side. You may not be able to see the entire lake. You certainly can't walk across it. They're different than rivers and streams. There's no discernible current where a trout would sit, or where you would think one would sit, um, those kind of things. It's vast, it's featureless, so where do you go? Well, I use, again, as I said earlier, the same three things that you think about in lakes, uh, in rivers and streams, rather, to fish lakes. And that's looking for areas that provide comfort, protection, and food. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then your powers of observation that bring all of these three factors into focus. So comfort, to me, this is perhaps the most important thing to think about when you're looking for trout in lakes, because comfort... These comfort factors govern the trout's metabolism, their ability to function, and if they can't function, they're not going to feed. So we're looking for things like factors such as water temperature and its relationship to oxygen content, the influence of weather, and the seasonal changes that lakes go through each year. And this not only affects trout's metabolism, it also affects insects too. So from an oxygen perspective, one thing to remember is the warmer water gets, the less oxygen it holds. And trout, compared to other fish, have a pretty narrow window of uh, activity where the oxygen content is sufficient enough that it allows them to function at peak efficiency. And I use 50 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit as my reference point. I'm looking for water temperatures in that range. I know trout are going to be active, they're going to be feeding. When water temperatures are below that 50 degree threshold, trout metabolism start to slow, they become less active. And conversely, when those water temperatures exceed 65 into the high 60s or even low 70s, trout activity really slows down. The water's holding less oxygen, they're starting to become stressed, and they don't eat. And when they don't eat, it's tough to, uh, to catch them on the fly. So this also impacts food too. So you've got to also consider water temperature and its impact on food as well. Because food, uh, aquatic insects rather, are and invertebrates, their activity is triggered by food. And in the case of aquatic insects that emerge, such as coronaments, mayflies, caddis, dragonflies, damsels, their hatch activity is directly influenced by water temperature. In lakes, you could argue that water temperature is the most important thing. So it always pays to have a thermometer with you to take those temperature readings. I use electronics in my boat, or if I don't have my electronics with me, I always have a thermometer. I'll lower it in the water, of course, and get surface temperature, but I'll also attach a small cord to it where I can lower it down into the depths and plumb different levels of the lake to find that, again, that 50 to 65 degree water temperature where fish will be. They're not going to be staying any amount of time in water temperature between outside rather of that 50 to 65 degree window. Another thing to consider are weeds. Weeds are going to be commonplace through these three factors I'm going to talk to you about today because weeds during the day take in through photosynthesis take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. So trout are gonna to like to hang around weeds for their oxygen value as well. They're also great places to find protection, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and of course, food. Inflow streams are particularly important because if you have a small inflow stream, they're going to bring in cool oxygenated water, brings in food, provides cover. So these are ideal spots to prospect in the warmer months when trout are looking for that cooler water temperature. If you have your lake has a little feeder stream coming into it, that can be an excellent place to find trout. Trout in lakes are also very subject to weather change. They just don't seem to like that period of change. Trout like a pretty constant environment to live in and cruise around and feed. When change comes in, it unsettles them. It'll uh, increase and decrease the activity. Probably the best example of this is when you have a cold front. So often this happens in the spring when you get very active weather, but a front is defined by the air mass that is moving forward or moving in. So you've got cool, dense air moving and pushing itself under warm air, and where those two air masses meet, that's called the front. It's, repre it's represented on a weather map. Um, looks like little pyramids or little points on there. And typically what happens, if you're fishing where that warm air is, and as that um, 
cold front advances, the fishing actually starts to pick up. It's almost as though those fish sense a period of change coming. You'll start to see clouds are developing vertically. You'll have um, storms, squall lines, things like that. And then the cold front passes. And typically, you're going to have a nice clear day, high blue skies, typically pretty strong winds, and that fishing is going to be poor. And until the, the uh, new front has established itself, um, conditions become steady again, um, the fishing will be pretty poor. So that period of transition right after a frontal passage for a day or two can be pretty slow fishing. You really got to slog and work at it. So that's something to think about as well in the comfort factors of what that does to a fish. So you're going to be looking to try and avoid um, days of transition. Because one thing's, until things settle down, trout just don't like, there's pressure changes, there is air temperature changes, which influence water temperature, light levels change, uh, wind moves water, all these kind of things. It just, it's as though, the analogy I use is as though the trout's world is a little snow globe and Mother Nature just gave it a really good shake and trout don't like that. And until things settle out again, fishing is tough. So these, again, some of the factors that influence um, on the comfort side of things. It's also important to remember that lakes go through seasonal changes as well. And this is a subject we can go into in much greater depth in a future podcast. But just like we experience on dry land, lakes go through cha seasonal changes, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And during these changes, it affects where trout are going to be. For example, if you look at the early spring, right after ice comes out, most lakes in North America uh, freeze over, and when they do, they stratify. Thermal stratification is called. So right when the ice comes off, those fish are in shallow water because that's where the oxygen is due to the stratification that's gone on through winter. So the fish are going to be shallow. And then as the days warm and the influence of the sun warms that upper cooler water, that cooler oxygenated water, the lake is going to become the same temperature or isothermal and then it'll mix. And this is a phenomenon often referred to as turnover. It's the closest things lakes get to runoff that you experience on rivers, most rivers and streams in the spring. And uh, during this time, uh, when the lake's turned over, um, the water's unsettled, the oxygen content, the wa water chemistry's off, the fish are unsettled for about five to seven days, and then things settle out. So those fish, after that lake is mixed, and that oxygen turnover is great because it takes that anoxic water that's uh, um, in the deep, and it'll circulate it up through uh, the water to the surface where it diffuses with atmospheric air. Because it's important to note that water temperature, when it's different, Differing areas of water temperature, rather, won't mix. It's a barrier to mixing uh, differing temperatures. So this turnover is a great process. It recharges, revitalizes the lake. And after the spring turnover, these fish can move around. Conversely, in the summer months, that uh, upper part of the lake gets very warm, low in oxygen. It's going to drive the trout deep right along the thermocline that forms, this is a little barrier, forms right at the extent of the sunlight and really separates the warmer, uh, low oxygenated area from actually a very anoxic layer below the thermocline. And the fish hang out there, often referred to as the summer doldrums. So these are things you've got to think about at what time of the season. And generally, early spring, right after ice off, trout are going to be shallow, less than 10 feet deep in the, in the margins, close to shore, in shallow bays. Once a lake's turned over, they can be pretty well everywhere. This also stimulates hatches. And then in the summer months, the water temperature is going to rise near the surface. Trout are become lethargic due to reduced oxygen content. They're going to move off the edges of drop-offs down into deep water and hover right near the thermocline that forms anywhere from 20 to 30 feet down, depending on lake clarity. The clearer it is, the further the thermocline forms, simply because the sun can penetrate further through clear water, the sun's energy. In the fall months, um, the lake's going to start to um, mix again because that uh, warm, low oxygen layer above the thermocline is going to cool as the days get shorter and the temperatures get shorter. And then that lake will mix again. Again, fishing will become unsettled for a few days. And then fish really put the feed bag on and feed aggressively, again, in the shallow. So understanding the seasons of a lake helps you predict, accurately predict, where fish are going to be. So it pays attention to understand how lakes work. Other factors that uh, influence lakes are things like wind. Wind will move fish around. Um, 
it creates wind lines, it creates foam lines are often called, and uh, European anglers, particularly uh, anglers in Great Britain, are very adept at fishing these foam lines, and they will form uh, channels um, of a flat and a and a foam line and a flat and a foam line and these are caused by circular currents and they'll concentrate food so um, wind is something you can use to your advantage you're going to experience it on lakes and frankly you've got to learn to to live with it because wind is actually your friend in controlled amounts so the next factor are the protection factors I call it so we've talked about comfort a little bit so protection are things that give the trout, I say, a sense of confidence, the willingness to come in and feed, to throw a bit of caution to the wind um, and, and hunt. So protection consists of the condition of the water's surface, um, light levels, uh, adjacency and proximity to structure, vegetation again, underwater weeds, and depth. So let's talk about those points a little bit more. So one of the things that provides trout with a sense of cover and protection is algae. Algae, you know, most people look at algal blooms that start to form in the late spring through the summer as an, a bit of an eyesore and, and, and really like, ooh, I don't know if I want to fish there, but algae is a plant and it's influenced by sun and photosynthesis. So it's going to all gather or try to gather right up in the upper part of the water column, let's say 10 feet deep or less. Underneath of that cap of algae, it's going to be relatively cool. Trout will be cruising around them, they're feeding because the algae is absorbing that sun's energy and helping keep that water below cool. Another influence to think about is the water surface. A rippled surface breaks up and diffuses light. If you think about it like a riffle on a river or stream, the same kind of impact. Trout feel comfortable and safe and confident feeding under that rippled surface. Um, they're, way, they're way more cautious when that water is flat calm. In fact, one of the toughest conditions to fish in um, is a flat calm, um, high blue sky day. That doesn't mean the fish aren't feeding, it just means we've got to be much better at our presentation to be successful because the fish can see everything. They're very wary and uh, get very spooky in those kind of dish conditions. So it's always nice to have a little bit of ripple on the water. So again, if you're trying to find fish and you've got the choice of two bays, you've got one with a little bit of chop on it and one with a little bit of a flat calm, it might be best to try that one with the ripple on the surface first because it's going to, again, mask your presentation and uh, allow you to get close to those fish without spooking them. Light is also important too. Um, I mentioned those clear blue days, but uh, fish like to, um, to feed you know, throughout the day, but where they are in the lake will be governed by the light levels too. So if you have a, a relatively sunny day out, the fish in the morning are going to be in the shallows. They're going to be feeding around in there. And as the light gets above the trees and gets directly on the water, that's going to often push them out um, from those shallow areas to the edges of drop-offs or even off the drop-off into deeper water. And knowing this allows you to follow them out. So early in the morning, late in the evening, you tend to fish shallower. And then towards as the day gets brighter, we slide out into perhaps deeper water. And this again is influenced by water clarity. Um, of course, these aren't absolutes. There's always, I've had days where <laughs> fish are feeding aggressively in clear, calm, shallow conditions that uh, just defy logic. But again, we're just trying to throw the odds in our favor and follow those sort of basic guidelines, fish shallow in the morning and evening, and then perhaps a little deeper um, during the main portion of the day. The other thing to think about in lakes is structure. Trout, like bass, are structure orientated, but they're not going to hold to points, as I said earlier in, the, in this uh, podcast. They do like to cruise along edges and things and irregularities. Trout love irregularities. So when I look at a lake, I'm looking for areas that uh, offer this. So um, we're talking points of land. We're talking shallow humps. We're talking drop-offs where the water transitions from shallow to deep water. Creek mouses I talked about area. These are areas that you want to stay near and fish aggressively. Spend your efforts fishing those areas because that's where the fish will be. In fact, most of the times in lakes, we're avoiding that deep middle portion of the lake because lakes are typically shallow around the edges and deep in the middle. There's always exceptions. They always have lots of character. Um, but structure is important. 
Now, if you were to cut a lake in half, you'd be broken into sort of three basic zones or areas. You'd have the shoreline area that's adjacent, uh, as the name would imply, adjacent to the shore of the lake. And let's say this is for uh, purposes of this discussion. We're talking depths from basically nothing to five feet. And then you'll have the shallow shoal area. That's sort of the area, say, adjacent to the shoreline, out to where the lake transitions to deep water or the drop-off region. And then from the drop-off region, you have the deep water zone. So if you look at these four zones, the shoreline area is important in the morning and the evening because trout will come in and feed here because of the reduced light levels. It's also, as I mentioned earlier, due to the seasons of the lake, areas to concentrate on in the early spring and late fall. The shallow shoal areas, and the shoal by definition is any portion of the lake's bottom that the sun actually strikes. And this is important for us as fly fishers because it's basically the grocery store of the underwater world because where it's influenced by light, it stimulates plant growth, which provides, again, as I talked earlier, a little bit of uh, oxygen um, for the fish and do photosynthesis. It also provides protection for the fish because the fish are camouflaged. They could swim through or over it um, and be very difficult to spot. And of course, it's home to that food. And we'll talk about food in a little bit more. Also, from a fly fishing perspective, it's our best bet to be because we're most effective as fly fishers in water 20 feet deep or less. And this is because we allows us to use our full range of presentation options. We can use floating lines with strike indicators, floating lines and long leaders, midge tip lines, slow sinking lines, washing line techniques if you're allowed to use multiple flies. There's lots of things you can do on the shoal area. If you're working out in the deep water zone, there's not a lot of food that lives out there as compared to the shoal area. And your presentation options narrow considerably because of the water depth you're faced with. Now, between the shoal and that deep water zone is the drop-off area, and trout love to cruise this. And whenever I fish a new lake or a lake I've known for years and, and go, I always gravitate to the drop-off areas. Trout love this area of transition because they have that deep water safe zone um, to their sides, and they can make little forays onto the shoal, grab a few bites to eat, and if anything spooks them, they're off into that deep water zone. So drop-offs, consider those like a game trail. Trout frequent those areas, and that's something you want to target. Now drop-offs can be steep and abrupt and almost cliff-like, or they can just be a shallow, gradual slope into deep water. And I like to fish what I call the light line, that transition on those shallow gradient drop-offs where you can see the lighter colored bottom where the sun is actually striking the bottom and reflecting back. And then all of a sudden it goes dark because the sunlight is no longer reflecting back. And it's great to cruise or work those light lines because trout like to sit just in that sort of twilight zone, uh, feeling safe and secure, and then they can ambush anything that goes by. And of course, the deep water zone, um, trout do go out there. You can catch them. Um, you're, again, as I said earlier, your presentations options are limited. They'll feed on zooplankton out here. They'll feed, chironomids can emerge in deep water areas. Uh, leeches, things like this. Bait fish can often congregate out there. This is an area you'd probably target in the summer months um, or on a bright, bright day when fish are just too skittish to spend much time in the shoal area. But your best bet is to stay on the shoals and on the drop-off area and you'll, you should run into lots of fish. So the, again, the importance of structure is critical. And when you get to a lake, you can use the land adjacent to the lake as a clue to the surface below. So if that land coming into the lake is on a shallow angle, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be shallow and um, areas there as well, and that's going to stimulate plant growth. If you're going to have a steep, abrupt slope into the lake, it's very good chance, it's very likely that it's going to be really deep there and depending on the time of year, not a lot of fish there. So you'd probably want to gravitate towards those shallow gradients where you're going to find those shoal areas. You're going to look for areas that channel trout movement. So again, I talked about a drop-off, a point of land. This finger looks like a little finger of land coming out under the water. It's got drop-offs all around its edges. Trout can cruise along the edges, cruise over top of the drop-off and feed. And they have, again, that adjacency to deep water. If you've got two points coming out, they'll form a little saddle. Trout love to to uh, to to cruise that area be, uh, along where that saddles form as those two fingers of land come out and actually meet underwater um, it'll be like like the term sounds it looks like a little underwater saddle um, 
Again, fishing adjacent to those deep water refuges, drop-offs, points of land, can't stress those enough. You always want to think edges, areas of transition. And it's not just shallow to deep water. It can be weeds to rocks. It can be rocks to weeds. It can be weeds to mud. Uh, again, trout love to cruise along those edges. So I spend my time, again, talk, I talked a lot about it, but targeting drop-offs, points, sunken islands, weed beds, if they're present, beaver lodges. Beaver lodges are like little wooden icebergs, if you will. The tip is sticking out of the water and along the shore, but that construction the beaver has done extends well out into the lake and its prime habitat. Minnows love to hang around it. It's a great place for aquatic insects and other invertebrates to live. And again, trout can scout and scoot in around those things. Great places. A little tough on the fly box at times, but because uh, you're hooking logs and rocks, and not rocks so much, but twigs. Um, but uh, just like nymphing on a river, if you're not putting your fly in harm's way, you're usually not fishing in the right place. And one of the things you can use to help you with your hunt for good structure is bathymetric maps and your sounder. Now, bathymetric map is an underwater contour map. And this can be very important to use because you can do a lot of this study before you ever leave the house. You can sit down with these bathymetric maps and have a look. Google Earth is another uh, um, excellent reference as well, but we'll talk about that in a second. So a bathymetric map, if you ever look at it, is just a series of, of lines that join areas of equal depth. And when these lines are close together, that means a rapid change in depth. So lines that are almost one on top of each other are going to indicate a drop-off. Where the lines are uh, quite far apart before changing depth, that's that shallow slope. That's going to be a nice flat. That could be a good coronamid flat, good place to visit in the spring months. You can see underwater points. And what you're doing here is building a little bit of a route map for when you get to the lake, you're going to attack it and... Um, target different areas in a logical manner as opposed to haphazard all over the place. Again, I, I mentioned Google. Google is an excellent resource because you can use Google Maps um, to identify structure as well. You can use uh, the contours you see around the lake and Google Earth. You can actually drill down and actually see those areas, make note of them, and again, help you demystify this lake so you're spending your time in those high percentage areas. Sounders are important. I'm a big believer in electronics. Um, I call them sounders because some people refer them to as fish finders, but fish finding is only one thing that they can do. I tend to use mine more for locating subtle features that don't always appear on bathymetric maps. You know, a little trench underneath that may be 20 feet long and 3 feet of difference. Trout will relate to that. Um, but you've got to understand the features of a sounder and use them to your advantage. So you've got to be able to change the settings because um, sensitivity, the strength of the pulse are often called gain. The more floating matter in the water, the um, the more you've got to reduce the sensitivity or your screen looks like a blizzard. But sounders not only help you find your fish, but more importantly, help you find structure. And that's key. So again, you're looking for changes in depth, uh, little underwater features that could attract fish and they could relate to. And now some of the newer sounders, you can actually build your own maps um, with the software within the unit. I use a uh, Humminbird uh, sounders myself personally. I've got a Helix 7. It has uh, auto chart live, so I turn that on every time I get on the water. So every time as I move around, um, the sounder works with the depth it's recording and the GPS locations to create this map that you can actually download and share with friends and colleagues. Or as you continue to explore that lake on different trips and subsequent trips, it's constantly building that map for you until you've got all the area of the lake mapped. And you can mark different locations using your GPS. You can mark waypoints so you can find those spots again and again when you've had some success. So a sounder is really an invaluable tool. So the third piece in, in my finding trout puzzle is food. And that's what fly fishing is primarily based upon, is imitating the food sources of trout or whatever fish you're chasing. Um, that's what we do with our flies and our techniques, is imitate that food most of the time. So food, if you go where food is, you're going to find trout. If you hang out around the grocery store, somebody is going to come in and you can catch them. So maybe a little bit of a weird analogy, but if you think about the, 
the people is uh, like trout. Um, if you go where the, the trout are going to be feeding, there's a good chance you can catch them. So where where is most of the food concentrated in lakes? Well, again, weed beds. You see, they're common to all three things. Weed beds provide oxygen in the form of from through photosynthesis. They provide protection. And of course, they're home to a majority of the food sources that live in lakes. And again, it's that shallow shoal area you want to be concentrating on because it's that sunlight that stimulates weed growth and then provides the habitat where food live. Pay attention to understanding the different life cycles. You don't have to have a degree in aquatic entomology, but you should understand the different food sources, what they look like, how do they emerge, when are they most likely to emerge, do they crawl out of the water to emerge like dragonflies and damselflies, or do they hatch at the surface like mayflies, most species of caddis, and chironomids. So it pays to understand those food sources. An invaluable tool in this, um, used correctly, is a throat pump. And a throat pump looks like a little turkey baster, and what it allows you to do is identify, obviously, the prey item that they're feeding upon. It identifies how big they are, because the fish has just consumed those items, we're actually, we call it a throat pump because we're actually sampling the esophagus, the entrance to the esophagus, not actually the stomach. It's not a stomach pump, as they're called. Um, it indicates the feeding activity when you learn how to interpret the samples and it indicates what the fish are feeding on and most importantly the fish survives. I do not throat pump every fish. I always throat pump the first one I catch and then depending on what those contents reveal I may not pump a fish for the rest of the day. When fish are feeding on chironomids that's probably the time I pump fish the most because fish can change their focus from small olive ones to larger brown ones to medium-sized black ones almost every hour as different species become active and emerge when they're targeting the pupa during their ascent. So that's probably the most times. But the way you want to use a throat pump is first of all you want to lubricate it. And how do you lubricate a throat pump? Well, you're going to put it in the water, suck a little bit of water up by squeezing the bowl back and forth, suck some water up there, but then expel that water so the pulp, sorry, the pump is empty. The bulb is empty. It's just it's moist inside and out. This just helps it slide down um, the fish's throat. You want to roll the fish over. When you invert a fish, it temporarily disorientates them. I tend to do this right beside my boat or my float tube or my pontoon boat while the fish is still in the water in the net. And then I depress the bulb by squeezing on it so it's about half collapsed. I slide it down the fish's throat until I feel the first signs of resistance. And you know you've got it right because if you take your hands off the, the bulb, it'll stay collapsed. Because what happens is the tip of that pump, when it comes in contact with the esophagus, the longitudinal muscles of the esophagus latch on, thinking it's food, trying to pull it down, and that creates a vacuum. Now, once that vacuum is created, then you just withdraw the pump, and you'll hear an audible sucking sound, and whatever that trout has just been recently feeding upon is sucked up into the bulb. You really don't want to follow the, the directions on these throat pumps suggest putting a little bit of water and firing it in first, then vacuuming all of that out. And what you run the risk of is pushing the very thing you're trying to find away from the uh, range of the throat pump. So that's why we just moisten it, slide it down, and it actually vacuums things up. And once this is done, you just release the, you know, rest and recover the trout and let it go. The whole process, once you get the hang of it, it's less than five seconds, probably more like three seconds. And if you're not comfortable doing it, don't. Wait until you're shown by somebody because the most important thing in this process is the welfare of the trout so that trout can swim away a little tired, a little hungry, but it got to survive. And then you can set about and interpret those throat pump samples. So what you do is I take the um, samples. You can get uh, vials off Amazon. You can take a little white margarine containers work well. Old ones, of course, that you've cleaned out. And then you, you would suck some water up into the tube and then squirt all of the contents into the vial or into that container and have a look. And throat pumps provide critical information. First of all, they're going to tell you what the fish is feeding on. Second of all, they're going to tell you the feeding depth. Because when you learn to interpret the food sources you see and where they live and where they're most likely to be found, that will tell you whether the trout are fishing near the bottom, mid-depths, or up near the surface. So for example, if I took a throat sample out of a fish and it had chironomid larvae or bloodworm in it and perhaps a few scuds, those are food sources that spend their portion of life in the case of the bloodworm or their life in the case of the scud swimming near the bottom. 
So where one trout is, pretty good chance the other ones are going to be. So not only are we trying to eliminate uh, areas where trout or deduce where trout it might be all over the lake, we're also trying to figure out where they are in the water column vertically too. And finally, the throat pump reveals feeding activity. So if those food sources are wiggling and moving, um, in many instances, they'll if they're insects, they'll hatch. Um, you know, if, if it's that time of the, in their life to, to hatch. So a lot of times when we're fishing chironomids, we'll squirt them out into, uh, you know, into a, a bowl or a dish, and then we look back later, and they've all emerged and, and taken off. So when those food sources are wiggling actively, you know that fish just ate those food sources re um, recently. So if you match um, that, you know, the, that food source, not only with your fly pattern, but your presentation techniques, there's no reason you shouldn't be catching fish. So when you look at things as well, again, I said understanding the different food sources, um, th there's lots of things for fish to feed on in lakes. That's one of the um, sort of one of the uh, attractions for me for lakes. If I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by insects. I'm fascinated by the natural world. And um, lakes, if you like to match the hatch, there are a ton of food sources to keep the trout occupied throughout the year. There is chironomids. They are the most widespread food source. Again, subject for a future podcast episode. Um, they basically hatch from as soon as the ice comes off in some way, shape, or form until the ice comes back on again. And if your lakes don't freeze over, they can trickle throughout the cooler months until the heaviest amount hatches emerge in the spring. So they tend to come off first. Your mayflies, if they're present, come off next. Damselflies often overlap with mayfly emergences. Your caddisflies are in Commonwealth country sedges. Um, dragonflies, the last sort of food source to emerge. Um, think of it, the smaller the item is, the more it tends to emerge. The larger stuff tends to emerge latest in the season. Bit simple, but it works. Um, water boatmen and back swimmers, if they're present, um, they're around all the time. They're uh, an air-breathing aquatic insect that lives in lakes. They, they uh, trap air along their bodies and scoot around the underwater world, uh, almost like a little scuba tank. But they go on mating and migration flights in the early spring, soon after ice off, and again in the fall months, right, um, late fall, mid fall to late fall. This is when they reach sexual maturity, and it's the only time they can fly. And then you've got your staple food sources, or bread and butter food items. And to me, those are the food sources that live in the lake all the time. They never transition into anything else. They don't hatch. They don't emerge. So we're talking about things like leeches, scuds, bait fish, crayfish if they're present. Um, and uh, zooplankton. And we also tend to include chironomids in there because of the larval stage and because of their, their hatch cycle is so widespread. There are more chironomid species in lakes than all the other aquatic insects combined. So there's typically always some species uh, being active and trout see so many chironomid pupa and chironomid larva throughout the season, they just instinctively react to a well-presented fly. So again, those bread and butter food sources, we're talking leeches, scuds, forage fish, zooplankton, crayfish if they're present, and chironomids. So when you um, get to a lake, the thing that brings these three factors, comfort, protection, and food together, is your powers of observation. Your eyes and your ears are arguably the best tool, but I always joke they're connected to your brain, and your brain tends to think it's the superior organ and, and overpowers everything and you've got to learn to believe what your eyes and your ears are telling you. Most often your eyes. We're using our ears to hear things like fish movement, things like that. Um, other anglers talking about the success they're having, those kind of things. But your eyes are great. So when you get to the lake shore, you want to start by turning over rocks and logs. You want to suppress that excitement, if you will, and invest 10 to 15 minutes of time along the shore and searching out to see what things might be happening. Pay attention to that shoreline area of the lake. Where's the steep side um, versus the shallow gradient to help you determine where shallow weed beds and shoal areas might be? Again, turn over those rocks and logs. See what's living under them. You'd be amazed at the number of different food sources that hide under these um, uh, items along the shoreline. Um, take a little aquarium net with you. Scoop it through the weeds. See what's living in there. And just simply, if it's half an inch long and green and there's lots of them, that might be the kind of food source to, to start imitating.
spider webs are always present if you're staying at a resort or a lodge there's often spider webs around have a look in those spider webs what has been caught in there any uh, emerging insects are going to be trapped in there and give you clues as to what hatches might be happening when you get out on the water don't be going around at 100 miles an hour. Uh, take your time. Look around. Pay attention to bird activity. If you see birds such as swallows, for example, flying low to the surface, they're feeding on emerging insects. And just like the ocean-going fly fisher uses birds to find bait balls and, and things like that, we can use birds to give us signs of a hatch because hatches in lakes can be very localized. Hatch in one bay, one portion of the lake. And if you see birds... Uh, low to the water like little gunships all over the water they're feeding on emerging insects so you can be pretty rest assured that if the activity is enough to draw the attention of birds there's going to be fish feeding on the emerging pupa or nymphs um, subsurface as well so you want to get over there and investigate that the other thing you want to pay attention to is when you see fish move. This is where your ears come in because you can you can hear the fish uh, moving if you don't quite see it and then turn and have a look. But if you see fish moving, making a disturbance on the surface, a rise form, a roll, whatever it is, um, it doesn't always indicate feeding, but it means fish are active. And among my friends, we use what we call the two fish rule. So if a fish rolls once, we pay attention. Fish rolls twice in an area, we want to go over and investigate because typically fish, particularly trout, will shoal up and uh, they don't swim in tight little schools uh, like bait fish do, but there's still, there may be a half a dozen or a dozen sort of working that area. You want to go over and investigate because at least, hey, I always joke you, at least you know there's a fish there. It gives you some sense of confidence. But um, again, when they're active like that and moving around and swirling at the surface, whether they're feeding or just chasing each other or pursuing a food source just beneath the surface that created the disturbance on the surface, um, you want to go over there because they're active. And an active fish can be coaxed to take the fly. You also want to pay attention to other anglers. Um, if an angler is having success, um, you, you probably don't want to you know, motor over there and, and get in their way and, and ask them um, what they're doing and everything because anglers can be pretty secretive. But you can sit and observe. This is where a pair of binoculars comes in very handy. You can pay attention to what types, what area of the lake, what sort of structures are they fishing. And maybe you can't get onto that structure as well because it's only room for one boat. Um, but you can certainly find similar structure in the lake and see if um, it's working um, for you as well as it's working for them uh, on those structures. You can pay attention to what fly lines are they using? What retrieves are they using? You know, sometimes people can be pretty secretive with their retrieves and sort of hide them down between their legs or be appearing to move the fly very fast by stripping rapidly, but really only grab the fly line on every fifth strip, all these kind of things. But I look at their fly line. Um, floating lines are brightly colored. You can see indicators, gives you an idea. Um, to govern retrieve speed, you can do things like uh, pay attention to the time between casts. If they take a long time between casts, that means they're moving the fly slowly. And when, again, when you start linking this with the time of the year and what insects or food sources might be available, um, it can give you a, a great place to start. So for example, let's say it's uh, early spring, the lake's turned over, you see an angler doing very well, you notice they're using a floating line, um, they may be using an indicator, they may not be. Um, they're casting an awful long, you know, they, they cast and they wait an awful long time before casting again. So the, whatever they're moving is very slowly. So what things move slowly at that time of the year could be calabatus nymphs, but more often or more likely it's coronamids and emerging coronamid pupa. So you can use, again, there's using those powers of observation um, to help you find fish consistently in lakes. So always pay attention to what others are doing. So when you're on the water, um, don't just sit in one spot. Um, move. You know, if you're going to fish from an anchored position, which is very popular in Western North America, um, you don't want to sit there forever. So if you're catching fish, obviously you'd want to stay because there's a um, concentration of fish working that area. But if you're not, move every 15 to 30 minutes. If I'm fishing flies very slowly, I will probably move more on that 15 minute range. If I'm moving the flies fast, meaning there's, you know, I'm moving the flies through the water at a more brisk pace, I might stick around a bit longer because the flies haven't been in the water long enough to perhaps attract a fish. If there's fish in the area, generally they're going to feed pretty quickly. Um, you know, so if you're presenting things properly and something they're interested in, um, 
you're, you're going to probably be successful. The thing you want to think about is a, a thing I call DRP. Most people, when they're not catching fish, blame the fly pattern. But the reality of it is, it's more often, unfortunately, us as anglers that's the problem with our success. So DRP simply stands for depth retrieve pattern. So the things you want to think about, do I have my fly at the right depth? That is arguably the most important factor in finding fish and catching fishing lakes is getting your fly to where the fish are. And typically they're going to feed or be most active uh, and be found in that water one to three feet off the bottom. It's safe and secure down there and that's where all the food is. R stands for retrieve. Are you moving the flies at the right pace? Most fly fishers I instruct and guide simply don't let their flies sink long enough and they don't move them slow enough. We want to use slow retrieves, erratic retrieves, lots of pauses in there. We don't want to be stripping our flies for the most part um, at Mach 7. We want to be slow and deliberate. Those insects and food sources we're trying to eat don't move very fast. And then you want to think about pattern. Now, most times if I'm sitting on a spot and I fished it for a while, that 15 to 30 minute window, and I haven't caught anything and I'm using a pattern I've caught fish on before, I have confidence in, I believe I'm moving it at the right uh, rate for the conditions, I'm feeding it, fishing it at the right depth, I'm going to move because if there's no fish there, no amount of playing around is going to fix that fact. You need to have fish. Um, if anchoring up and targeting specific structure isn't working, consider if you want to troll, you can do that too. But I prefer to fish a drogue, which is a lock style technique. A drogue is a big underwater parachute. Again, this is subject for another podcast that actually slows and controls the drift of your boat. You still cast downwind, cast and retrieve. This parachute, this drogue is deployed upwind and allows you to drift and cover a large expanse of water, exposing your flies to more fish. Very popular in Europe. So that's a, a something to consider when you're on the water if your anchored techniques aren't working. Again, I mentioned using bathymetric maps, following a logical, efficient path. Don't jitterbug all over the place. Move from one spot, target one area of the lake, and work your way around logically so you're spending your time productively, um, giving you the best chance of the fish. If you're constantly on the move and moving back and forth all over the place in an erratic, uh, illogical manner, um, you're wasting time. Um, try to move. And when you do move, you don't have to make an exponential move. Sometimes if you're fishing along a shoreline, you might move down two or three cast lengths and try there like that. Don't spend more time fishing than moving if you can. And when you're out there, make notes. Um, you know, years ago it was a notepad. Nowadays with uh, smartphones, you can just sit and make notes. I still keep a diary to this day. I pay attention to water temperature, um, hatches that I've seen, weather conditions, flies that work, flies that didn't work, presentation techniques, fast retrieves, slow retrieves, hand twists, strips, every piece of information you can get and after a while you're going to start to notice patterns that repeat not only on that lake you're fishing but on other lakes too um, they all behave similarly at times and it's those intersections of information that are going to help you find fish more efficiently the next time you're out on the lake so I mentioned retrieves on lakes, just touch on this a little bit. You always want to vary your retrieves, um, both in the length of the pull, the pace of what you're doing, and the pauses. A retrieve is based on those four, four items. The length of the pull, the speed of the pull, the overall cadence that you're using, and the pauses. And it's usually those pauses that are important because that's the movement of the fly attracts the fish in, they see it, they come over to investigate, and then it pauses and they have the opportunity to jump on it then. Much like when you're playing with a cat with a, a string, piece of string or a laser pointer, um, you can get those attracted to that. And as soon as that stops, boom, they jump on it. So think about that as well. So keep your retrieves varied. Don't make them robotic and always the same pace. Go fast, go slow and experiment. And of course, when you hook a fish, try to remember what you were doing so you can repeat it again. Generally, when it's cooler, uh, or you're fishing in situations where fish are pressured, meaning they see a lot of anglers, or the weather's poor, that area of transition we talked about before, that's when you're going to use slower paced retrieves. Your little pinch strips, 
slow hand twists, long, slow pulls um, to do that. Um, you're going to use more active retrieves when you want to cover water. Um, we do fish flies in an attractor mode where we are trying to trigger a reaction, an aggressive response from a fish, or, or a response out of curiosity. Uh, or territoriality to our fly. Fish don't always take our flies out of a feeding response, so attractor techniques can be used um, to your advantages. Um, that's when you're going to use more active retrieves. And when fish are aggressive and seem willing to chase, then you're going to be using more active retrieves to catch them that way. You're always experimenting, and you're going to vary your retrieve both horizontally and vertically. Um, so horizontally, I mean by you want to fan cast. So when you're on an area of a lake you're targeting, you if you imagine that the stern of the boat is uh, 9 o'clock and the bow is 3, you're going to try and place casts on every hour and present your fly at different angles all the way around. Fan it around. Don't always cover the same stretch straight downwind. Um, you're also going to um, play with your retrieves and your presentations vertically by how long you let the fly sink before you start your retrieve or what line choices you're going to use to target those different depths so you can find fish. One of the lines I like to use a lot in these situations, particularly when I'm fishing in deeper waters, is a line called a sweep line. A sweep line has differing densities along its length. The real lines I like to use have a uh, slower paced tip section, a faster paced middle section, belly section, and then a slower paced uh, density rather uh, rear section, this induces the line to sink in, in a sort of a U-shaped uh, path, if you will, so you can sweep your flies from shallow in the beginning of the retrieve, down later through the retrieve at deeper depths, and then back up towards the surface and get that U-shaped path and then you're going to try and, if you get a fish, make note of where the retrieve. If you're getting fish consistently in the first portion of the retrieve, that typically means the fish are higher in the water column. If you're getting your retrieves late in, the, in, the, um, uh, in your presentation when the line is at its deepest, that's going to tell you that the fish are deeper. And then you can perhaps adjust your presentation to take advantage of that knowledge. Things don't happen by accident on, when, you do, when you're fishing, so pay attention, and then you can again target that water. This is what I'm talking about vertically. Where in the water column are the fish feeding? Most of the times, as I said earlier, they're fishing in that narrow band, one to three feet off the bottom, or just below the surface is any sort of emergence going on. Usually if they're fishing at the surface, you can see signs of that through um, rise forms and things like that. So again, just to summarize, if you go back to your river and stream days or look at how you'd approach your river and stream, you're going to use the same basic principles, the same factors that you do fishing rivers and streams on lakes. Again, we tweak them a little bit to fish, fit the environment we're fishing in. So again, that's comfort. So that's water temperature. And what's important about that is its relationship to oxygen content. Remember, as water temperature increases, its oxygen content decreases. Trout like that. I use 50 to 65 degrees as my sort of trout happy zone. If I can find those water temperatures in there, um, that's when trout are going to be, their metabolism is functioning efficiently. They're going to be feeding, feeding often, digesting quickly, and feeding again. That makes a great opportunity for us to catch them. Think about those seasonal changes. The changes lakes go through, through over the winter months, the stratification, uh, post ice off, turnover, summer doldrums, the fall period, back into winter, that moves trout around in the lake. You're not going to be fishing the same spot you were fishing in early spring in the middle of August in the northern hemisphere anyway. And again, remember and consider the impact of weather change. Um, trout don't like that period of change. It's been my experience, still water trout. Um, you want to try and find those nice steady weather conditions. Fishing is usually best, but understanding if you're in a situation where the weather is changing, how to take advantage of it. Then there's the protection factors. These are the things that uh, give the trout a sense of confidence to feed, throw a bit of caution to the wind, if you will, um, and feed more aggressively. Um, so think about the water surface. A rippled water surface is going to break up and diffuse light. Think about the influence of light. When the light is on a low angle to the water, fish are generally going to be shallower and feel more safe and comfortable in those areas. When the direct light starts to hit that water and, and expose them a little bit more, trout are going to slide out in a little bit of deeper water where they feel more safe and secure. Always think about structure. So we're talking drop-offs, points of land, sunken islands. 
weed beds, those kind of things, adjacency to depth. Trout like to cruise along the edges of weed beds, drop-offs, those areas, so they can feed uh, when they want and when they need to, but if something startles them, they're into the deep water uh, until that uh, danger or perceived danger passes by and they'll come again. So you want to always target those areas of transition. Uh, drop-offs, if I had to pick one spot, uh, two spots to fish on a lake, it would be targeting points of land and drop-offs. I really like fishing drop-offs, especially if there's weeds on one side, on the shallow side of the drop-off, and deep water on the other. I'm going to try and target that seam between the, the shoal area and the drop-off area because that's a common game trail if you like trout are going to cruise along. And of course, food. Food is what uh, the imitation of the food sources trout and other game fish feed upon is the foundation of fly fishing. So again, weed beds. You see the, the weed beds are common to all three factors, but weed beds are the supermarket of the underwater world. You are going to find most of your weed beds in shallow shoal areas because weed growth is directly influenced by sunlight. Weeds need sunlight, just like our plants on land do, need sunlight to photosynthesize and grow. It pays to understand the life cycles of uh, the different food sources in lakes so when you see a particular food source you know whether it's a nymph whether it's a pupa um, whether it's a leech whether it's a scud so you can choose the right pattern and more importantly the right presentation technique to imitate it so that's where understanding the food source behavior is does it crawl does it swim does it scurry does it emerge at the surface does it crawl out of the water um, to uh, emerge. Does it emerge at all? Is it uh, a bread and butter food source? And remember those bread and butter food sources are leeches, scuds, bait fish, crayfish if they're present, zooplankton, and because of their prolonged hatch cycle and their larval stage, coronamids as well, uh, particularly in western lakes and uh, in eastern lakes to some degree. So if you put those three things together and start using them and then use your powers of observation, um, train your brain to, to believe what your eyes are seeing and what your ears are hearing, um, you can successfully find trout in lakes consistently. This is the sort of the methodology I've used for many years and it's worked for me all over North America down into South America. Whenever I uh, get onto a new lake or an old lake that I fish many times, I use these three factors, comfort, protection, and food, and my powers of observation to catch more fish. So hopefully you enjoyed today's podcast. If you want to learn more about still water fly fishing, I encourage you, if you can, to pick up, if you haven't already, a copy of my latest book, The Orvis Guide to Stillwater Trout Fishing. It contains an entire chapter dedicated on how to find trout in productive still waters and in even not productive still waters. I use the, the same logic. If you want to get a hold of me, obviously keep listening to this podcast uh, and uh, send your comments and questions into me. I'll answer those questions at the beginning of every podcast, or those questions could be formed the basis of a separate podcast as well, because as I alluded to in this podcast, there's many elements within the content I covered today that are worthy of uh, discussion or a podcast of their own. Um, you can reach me through my email at flycraft at shaw.ca. You can check out my website at flycraftangling.com. If you're interested in purchasing Stillwater specific products, I encourage you to visit mine and good friend Brian Chan's online Stillwater fly fishing store at stillwaterflyfishingstore.com. You can reach out to me through Facebook and Instagram. Check out my fly tying and fly fishing videos on YouTube. Phil Roy on the Littoral Zone, part of the Wet Fly Swing podcast and Swing Outdoors. I wanted to give Phil a big thank you before we get out of here for putting this one together. I hope this uh, special series gives you a chance to let Phil up the level of your Stillwater game. And we'll definitely, I know it's going to up the level of this podcast. I'm with you on this one. I'm excited as a listener of this new podcast. And, uh, and to hear one of the experts in the fly fishing space. We're going to try to publish these every month starting out uh, as we go. And uh, But if you're really excited and you really love this, want to hear more, definitely let me know. And we'll talk to Phil and see if we can convince him uh, to do a few more episodes as we head into the year. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but I'm excited for this one. One big reminder before we get out of here. Uh, we are also working with Phil on the Stillwater Schools. Uh, these Stillwater Schools are where we're getting a chance to not only do a, an event, typically a giveaway event around these schools, but also getting a chance to connect with a few people on the water to select lakes around the country, both the U.S. and Canada right now. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash Stillwater School. That's Stillwater School 
for a chance to connect and find out more about these schools with Phil and, uh, and yours truly and some of the great uh, listeners of this podcast. If you want all the show notes for this episode, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash LZ1. That's LZ1 for Littoral Zone Episode 1. So if you head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash LZ1, we'll have a transcript over there. We'll have some links that Phil talked about and just a quick little show notes summary of this episode. A good chance. That transcript is a good way if you ever have any questions. We've got every word we Phil spoke will be in that transcript, so it's an easy way to search if you forget what section uh, specifically uh, we were talking about here today. Okay, now let's let Phil take this one away, and the first episode of the Littoral Zone, we're almost out of here. Thanks for listening. Get out there, explore your local lakes, explore lakes distant from your home as well, fish as much as you can, and remember, you never stop learning. We'll see you next time.